us this morning and stand and sing, He is able. Stand as we sing. seated and our Lord is able to carry us through it's so glad so glad you could be here this morning welcome to Beulah Baptist Church on this Lord's Day we hope that you were blessed as a result of having been here this morning if you are a newcomer or if you've been here for three or four times now and you haven't yet filled out one of the little blue cards uh, they're in the pew racks if you'd complete that and place it in the offering plate that would allow us to get in touch with you and just uh, to express to you how glad we were to have you here this morning and then to keep you informed as to any things that are coming up that may be of interest uh, to you. But we just hope that you're blessed through the singing, through the fellowship, and the proclamation of God's word today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the season of summer and for the things that we can do outdoors and for all the things we can get accomplished. But, Father, we pray that during this service this morning that we would put other things to the side, that we would focus upon you, that we would just uh, fix our gaze upon you and your Son, that we would draw deeply from your Word, that we would be governed by your Holy Spirit. And, Father, may we be prepared for ministry as we go from this place. And if there's an individual here who doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, we pray that this morning that person would say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And give me a new heart and mind so that I may serve you. Father, we'll give you all the glory and honor for everything that's accomplished here. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue on with our service and stand and sing, Seek Ye First. Stand as we sing. time Jay's going to come and share our announcements. Morning. Morning. All right. Now our bulletin's pretty much uh, all the 200th anniversary. This week it's 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 here. So we've been talking about it for a while and uh, 200 years in the making. So hey, here we go. So Friday, you get the whole list for the gospel sing. It'll be 7 p.m. here in the, the sanctuary. So you can see all the different people coming out for that. So I uh, hope you can come out and enjoy that. And then Saturday is our, is our family dinner at 4 p.m. So, you know, you had to have a reservation. So I hope you, hope you are on the list there. So we're looking forward to that. That should be pretty neat and during that time. Uh, John White's server is going to give a little bit of a history, and Marilyn's got a skit ready. So, I, uh, you know, I've heard that there's been lots of Roger kids that have been uh, volunteered for this one. <laughs> no, we don't get volunteers, we just turn your kids until you have to do the 
there you go. So we're looking forward to, to seeing that skit. Now, if you, you know, if you some, something happened, you didn't get on the, the reservation list or something, don't worry. We are videoing both of those, so uh, you'll, you can enjoy those later. And then uh, Sunday, we'll have uh, you know, our regular services with some uh, special speakers there. And then during the, um, the Sunday school hour, Roanne's got a, a, a special thing she's doing about uh, her and Pastor McDonald's years here in the ministry. So we're really, really looking forward to that. All right. So it's here. I'm really, really looking forward to it and can't wait to see all that. Also, you'll see in there about the ABW ladies uh, having their planning meeting on the 26th. And then in your insert there, where is it? Okay. Yeah, they've got their spiritual growth retreat coming up there. So check that out later. And then uh, our Tiger Lake cruise that we're doing on September 9th there. That's uh, the Beulah Baptist family's going out for, for that. So uh, sign up sheets on the back table with that. So be sure to check that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, the the August 1st. August 1st. <laughs> so there's going to be openings on the Lancaster bus trip? Uh, oh, you still got the seats. Okay, yeah, yeah. So if you haven't made your final payment, hey, you're late. So the Lancaster bus trip. So, uh, all right. Let's see. Oh, man, I, that's right. Uh, Sonia, Sonia Knotts has her. She was going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Good News Club. There we go. And I'm going to go back here and start the video once you give your lunch break. Good morning. Um, last year was our first year of Good News Club at Anna Jarvis, and we're going to continue on this year. And so we're super excited about this. And I wanted to show you a video to remind some of you what it is and others that don't know so that you have an understanding of what it is and um, encourage you to volunteer. But I'll tell you a little bit more after that, after the video. What is Good News Club? Good News Club is an exciting opportunity for elementary age kids to participate in an engaging and uplifting after school program. All kids are welcome to join in on the fun in a safe environment where they can meet new friends, play games, sing songs, and learn the good news about Jesus Christ. During each club, boys and girls will learn Bible verses, participate in interactive songs, and hear life-changing lessons from God's true word, the Bible. Throughout every activity, they will learn more and more about who God is. Good News Clubs are sponsored and organized by Child Evangelism Fellowship. We're a Bible-centered organization committed to helping boys and girls around the world know who God is and how they can have a relationship with Him. And by partnering with churches in your local area, we're able to host Good News Clubs in your community and nearby public schools. Good News Club, like any other after-school program, has equal access to the public schools, which was granted by the Supreme Court in the early 2000s. We ensure your child will be taught in a safe environment by volunteers and teachers who have been carefully screened and trained. Children will learn, grow, and develop healthy relationships with those around them and with God. Every child with a completed registration form is welcome to be in Good News Club. We hope your child can be a part of this safe program full of fun, friendship, and learning. We'll see you at Good News Club. So we meet on Thursdays at Anna Jarvis from 3 to 4.30. And um, it's such a great opportunity to work with our children. Andre Mel um, does lunch duty, and she said that the kids would get so excited about learning their memory verses that they would want to tell her even before Good News Club. So it's such a rewarding experience. You don't have to be gifted or talented. All you, what we really need are adults that will sit and talk with the kids and just shepherd over them. And um, so if you feel God calling you to do this, please see Pastor, I, or Melinda, um, and we will be glad to give you an application to fill out. So pray about it. Pray that God will provide um, the a right amount of people for our students. Because last year we had about 70 at one point signed up. So um, the more we keep going, the, gr the more it's going to grow. So just be in prayer for it and prayerfully consider volunteering. Thank you.
Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, really looking forward to that getting started. And school starts back up this week, so yeah. All right, let's get to our birthdays. We got Daniel Dowdy, Nick Gaston, Jerry White, Hayden Robinson, Jamie Knight, Carl Mor Moran, Mike Swisher, Jeffrey Dodge, and then anniversaries, Greg and Sabrina Weber, and David and Donna Jolliffe. So happy birthday, happy anniversary, everybody there. And our scripture reading comes out of the book of Hebrews. Chuck's gonna come and read that to us. Say it, you know. I shouldn't say you're gonna read out a second Hebrews this time. <laughs> well, you Baptists just don't forget, do you? Our scripture is out of Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 17. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight, pa uh, straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness and without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicators or profane persons like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know the afterward, when he wanted to inherit the, uh, the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. May God have a blessing on his word. <clears throat> Thank you, Chuck. And if our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering. Scott Summers, if you could pray for the offering, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessing of your life for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, and Lord, that there's one here that doesn't know you personally as your Savior. Lord, we just pray that today would be the day to come to you. We thank you for the ability to give, Lord. We just thank you for the ability that we give to you, Lord, and you use to glorify and praise your name. We thank you all in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This time we have a special from the choir.
Thank you, choir. At this time, Pam Schrock's going to come and sing us a song. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Trying to catch my breath here. <laughs> Like you've never known But things change when You're down in the valley Don't lose faith For you're never alone For the God on the mountain Is still God in Thank you, Pam. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 272, The Solid Rock, and we'll go ahead and let the kids go downstairs for Junior Church. 272, stand as we sing. plays the next verse we'll let the choir go down and you get around and greet one another this morning
And the last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, rest in his righteousness alone, call lust to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. You may be seated. We come now, of course, to our prayer time and uh, have a lot of things to remember in prayer. So uh, as you look to your bulletin, uh, you'll find an insert there that has a prayer request on it. So review that and make sure you're aware of the, the needs that exist here in the congregation and things that you can lift up, also needs in the community, uh, and just continue to pray for those. There's a few things that I'd like for us to focus our prayers upon this morning. Uh, first of all, the 200th anniversary celebration. It's here. Uh, it begins on Friday. And so you heard Jay talk about that. There's information in your bulletin. You've read information. You've heard about it. Well, the time has arrived. And so just pray that God works through all of this to glorify his name. Uh, we've been blessed uh, with 200 years here as a congregation. We've had all kinds of folks that have been faithful to the Lord and sharing his word and so but just pray that this is something that glorifies him and also it's something not just that looks back but also something that looks forward because actually on next Sunday that will be the first day of our 201st year uh, and so just uh, pray that God would use this to to inspire us uh, to move into the future for the next uh, 200 years um, so anyway uh, just lift that up to God in prayer and ask that he move through all of that let's also pray for Awana as it starts up in the near future for Lisa as she leads that and for sufficient workers to come in and be a part of that and then of course you've already heard about good news clubs uh, pray for the good news club uh, uh, at Anna Jarvis uh, there's a church sponsor uh, usually for every club um, there's been a club for a few years now at West Taylor uh, but we now have a club at Anna Jarvis, and Beulah is sponsoring that. And so let's pray that we have sufficient workers for that, and God just sends folks into his harvest field. Uh, and pray for uh, Sonia as she leads that and for others as they participate. Um, also pray for all of the children and the youth who are returning to school. Uh, just pray that God guides them and helps them in that transition, that he also helps the parents. Uh, sometimes it's tough on the parents that God works with the teachers, just every aspect of this, that it be something that be very helpful uh, to the children and ease them through this transition process. Most importantly, let's pray for the lost. And I've encouraged you really since I came here uh, to pray for three or four lost folks by name. And so lift those up to God, family members, friends, people in the community, but three or four folks that you're really concerned about, pray for them by name. And if one of them happens to get saved, let us know, and then we can share that with other folks, and that will just encourage us to pray that much more. So, But anyway, let's keep all of those concerns in mind as we go to God in prayer, and you may have other things that you'd like to lift up to the Lord this morning. Feel free to do that. Also, if you're here and you'd like to slip up to the front and, and kneel down at the altar while we pray, feel free to do that. That, that invitation is always open. Sometimes I forget to say it, uh, but that's always open. So feel free to come if you'd like to do that uh, during our prayer time. So we're going to have a few moments of private meditation, and after that we'll be led together in our praying. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, many of us may be troubled about things around us, about things in our own lives or developments in the lives of others. But Father, may we take to heart the, the words of the song that is being played that Jesus is Lord of all. And regardless of what happens, regardless of the circumstances in our own lives or in the lives of those around us or in our nation or in our world, you are still very much in control. And so, Father, may we turn our eyes away from the troubling nature of the circumstances. And may we turn our eyes to a, a sovereign and all-powerful, all-knowing, all-caring God. Father, we know that you rule and you reign. And forever you will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, Father, this morning may our hearts be at peace. May we rejoice in the Lord, knowing that, that your plan will prevail. And Father, we pray this morning that you would just guide us in everything that we do, that every aspect of our life will bring glory to you. We pray, Father, for those who are ill in our church congregation, that you grant healing to their bodies. And Father, for those who don't receive healing, we pray that you give them comfort and peace and strength. And we thank you for the ultimate healing that's available for your people as we pass from this life into the next. Because in your presence, there is no sorrow, there is no parting, there is no pain or sickness. So Father, we thank you for all the promises that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For our 200th anniversary celebration, as it begins on Friday, we pray that every aspect of this would glorify you. May we be inspired as a result. Father, may we enjoy the time of fellowship we have with, with church family and friends, and may that warm our hearts. But may we be focused more upon you, and may we realize the God who has brought us this far can continue to carry us into the future and to continue his work here in this place because you do not change. We pray, Father, for the Awana program as it gears up and for the Good News Club as it starts in a few weeks. We ask that you would provide workers for both of these vital ministries that we may give future generations a solid biblical foundation, that we may share with them the gospel, that we may see them come to a saving knowledge of Christ, and then that they may have an impact upon those around them. And we pray, Father, that you would minister not only to the children and not only to the workers, but Father, also touch their parents and their families. For many of these, these parents and families, they need to be drawn closer to you as well. They may need even to be saved. Father, use these opportunities to touch not only children, but, but entire families and neighborhoods for your glory. And Father, we pray for the children and the youth who are returning back to school. Father, guide them, provide for them, give them your peace, guide their parents, guide the teachers. Father, may everything just go smoothly for them. And then, Father, most importantly, we pray for the lost that you would use each one of us to be a powerful Christian witness to people who need to, need to know Jesus. Father, through the love that we show, through the joy that we possess, through the, the lives that we lead, Father, may it speak volumes to them. And then we pray that we would not just model a, a Christian lifestyle, but Father, may we actually share the gospel as you have called us to do. When the doors are open, when the opportunities arise, give us boldness, give us wisdom, empower us by your Holy Spirit to speak your truth so that others can experience new life in Christ and so that they can enjoy all the many wonderful things that we now have as the children of God. We pray, Father, that you forgive us of our sins. All of us struggle in, in one way or another, so Father, when we do stumble, when we do fall, we thank you for the promise that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, strengthen us now as we open up your word. May it speak to our hearts. May it enlighten our minds. May it empower our wills. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we ask all these things. Amen. 
Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 17 is our passage for this morning. If you haven't already turned there, please do so. Yesterday, I was privileged to be able to work with a few members of Beulah Baptist in doing short video interviews that will be a part of this 200th anniversary celebration. And there will be a packet of videos that are available to you, a packet of DVDs, I believe it's four in number, uh, that we'll have to give to you, but the things that take place here, the video interviews that have been done, all of those sorts of things. Jerry's put together a nice uh, presentation as well, so all of that will be available to you to, to commemorate and just as a keepsake uh, for this very special time in the church's history. And the videos will be kept as a part of the church's history as well where we're interviewing leaders of the church, uh, uh, members of the church, and we've gotten their thoughts and their feelings on the congregation here at Beulah. Several questions were asked. When and where were you saved? Now, that was one of the questions that was posed. And uh, then what is your very first memory of Beulah Baptist? And for some of our, our longstanding members, it's fascinating to hear the responses that they had. And then what is your favorite memory of Beulah. Out of all the memories that you have, what's your very favorite memory of Beulah? And then another question that was asked was, what makes Beulah Baptist so special to you? Here and now, in this present time, what makes Beulah Baptist such a special congregation to you? Now, 10 members were interviewed, and all 10 had the same basic theme to the answer for that last question. They said, Beulah is a loving family. The people here truly love one another. This congregation truly cares. Ten people were interviewed. Ten people had the basic same answer to that question. That love that we have here at Beulah stems from a right relationship with Christ and being grounded in his holy word. Jesus says in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's one of the most powerful witnesses we can have for Christ to love one another. Now what puts that love at risk more than anything else is sin. Living in the flesh rather than living in the spirit has a great poses puts that a great jeopardy that love that we have now many sins are easy to identify they're they're out in the open they're obvious but secret sins are much harder for folks to see and they're harder for you and me oftentimes to identify on ourselves and usually they're much more dangerous as a result one of those secret sins is the sin of bitterness now, all of you here this morning have been affected or you've been tempted to be bitter in one way or another. I've been tempted with that. I've struggled with that. I've worked through that. It's a dangerous emotion. It's a dangerous sin that can consume individuals. It can consume marriages and, and it can destroy families and it can ruin churches. Some people can become bitter towards God. Uh, blaming him for something painful that happened. God, why did you allow this to take place? And so bitterness creeps into their heart and minds. Some people become bitter towards an authority figure, such as a boss or a teacher or, or some other person, and so they just begin harboring that bitterness and they hold on to it for years. Some people will be, become bitter towards a parent, deeply resenting over time the, 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 the time that was not spent, the love that was not shared, the needs that were never, ever met. And so they carry that bitterness with them for the rest of their lives. Some people get bitter towards the church because of bad experiences they've had or someone that hurt their feelings or because things did not go exactly the way they needed to go or they felt that they should go. So bitterness arises when someone has wronged you in some way or you feel like that you have been wronged in some way. One pastor defined bitterness as harbored hurt hidden in the heart. Now that's a typical pastor uh, definition. It's got all that alliteration to it. Let me say that one more time. Harbored hurt hidden in the heart. Bitterness will turn healthy relationships into cold shells if it is not soon removed. 
The sooner you can be rid of better, bitterness, the better off that you are. So this morning's passage is about spiritual strength and living in such a way that we honor the Lord. Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 14 says, Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now the sin of bitterness will disrupt that peace and that holiness. And so there's three things to know about bitterness from this passage this morning. First of all, the sin of bitterness has a deep root. It has a deep root. Verse 15 says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness is described here as a root. Now, a root is something that's beneath the surface. It's usually invisible to the eye, but it's real nonetheless. And even though it's not far from the surface, it reaches down deep into the soil of a person's heart. Now, this root, it takes very little soil to, to, to exist. It needs very little cultivation. It's very quick to grow, and it's very difficult to remove. In fact, you can't do it on your own. And you can get bitter for at least one of three reasons. First of all, you can get bitter of what's been done to you. You can get bitter over that. You can get bitter because of what's been said about you or about someone close to you. Or you can get bitter because of what's taken. From you, what you feel like that you should have had, and for some reason or another, you've been deprived of that. Now, Jesus dealt with all three of these situations in, the, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses, Matthew 5 through 7, chapters 5 through 7. Concerning what is said about you, concerning remarks that are made about you or someone else, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 11 through 12, Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me in other words because you're following me and obeying me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you if someone has said something wrong about you or something malicious towards you or something hurtful to, to you because of christ you are in great company the prophets received the same kind of treatment, and Jesus received that as well. So there's no need or cause to be bitter. When you stand for Jesus and you commit yourself to following him, it's going to happen to you. Eventually, something, somebody will say something that's hurtful. Someone will say something that's not true. Someone will say something that's not accurate. 1 Timothy 3.12 says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It will come. Then concerning the wrong done to you. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5.38-39. Then you have heard it was said, Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, Jesus here is not making a case for pacifism. What he, he's not saying that you shouldn't defend yourself. What he is saying is that you should never retaliate, that you should never take matters into your own hands because vengeance belongs to God. Jesus is saying it's not so much what happens to you that's important, but it's how you respond to that. Do you respond in grace or do you respond in anger and hurt and malice? Then concerning what is taken from you, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 40, and if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. In other words, all things belong to God. It all belongs to him. God's going to take care of you. He's taken care of you in the past. The point here in all of these things is that it's better to be wrong than it is to do wrong in retaliation. So when someone does you wrong, and it's going to happen sooner or later, and for most of you here it's already happened a few times, you have one of two choices. You can get bitter, and you can stay bitter, and some folks stay bitter for years. Or you can get better with the help of God's grace, because you can't do it on your own. You've got to have God's grace. That's why God's grace is the focus of this passage. These choices are the only two you have. You can get better and stay bitter, or you can get better with God's grace. And you will choose one or the other. Second, the sin of bitterness has a troubling fruit. It has a troubling fruit. 
Verse 15 says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. See the grace of God there, you miss the grace of God, the bitterness springs up. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. A bitter root always produces bitter fruit. There are no exceptions to that. You cannot stay bitter and not have it affect you deeply. This bitter fruit, first of all, saturates your mind. It will consume you and it, your mind will just absorb that like a sponge. Your mind will be drawn again and again to the object of that bitterness, whatever it is. Bitterness and depression also go hand in hand. I've never met a bitter person who's happy. Now, they may have a, a facade of happiness, but down deep inside, there's, there's, there's a negativity there. There's a depression there. They're not rejoicing in the Lord. They're just commiserating their own circumstances. Bitterness will depress you so much that you can't even function properly at times. A Christian man by the name of Edwin Markham was a great poet. He'd reached the age of retirement, and then after he'd, he'd earned quite a bit of money as, as, as a poet, and he was, he was well-read, and his works were purchased, but then he discovered that his banker had swindled him out of all the money that he had, and so when he was ready to retire, he didn't have any money. He was broke. He was penniless. And he became so bitter at that banker who had wronged him that he could no longer write poetry. He couldn't do it. That was his livelihood, but he couldn't produce it. The candle of Christian joy that was in his heart had been consumed by this darkness of bitterness. He became obsessed with wanting to do this banker harm. He wanted to even the score. He always thought about it. He was sitting for hours plotting of ways that he could get even. One day in a depressed funk, he was sitting at his desk and he was doodling, he was drawing circles on his paper because he couldn't write any poetry because his mind was so, so obsessed and he was thinking about that banker. Finally, the thought came to mind, Markham, if you do not deal with this thing, it's going to ruin you. You cannot afford this price you're paying. You must forgive that man. The great poet then prayed, Lord, I forgive him. And I do freely forgive him. And at that moment, that very moment, Markham said that he felt something in his heart change. Joy came back to him. His mind was freed, and he was able to write poetry again. He sat down, and he wrote one of his most popular poems called Outwitted. And part of that poem says, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Bitterness will bankrupt your spirit of joy. And forgiveness and showing the grace of God is your only option. If you want to survive, if you want to thrive as a follower of Christ, you must forgive. You are called to forgive, and you have the power to forgive with the Holy Spirit who lives within you and his grace that is shed abroad there. Forgiveness and grace are the only antidotes for bitterness. Well, well preacher, what about, what about that banker? What, what, what happened to him? Did, did things get settled? I really don't know. I don't know the, 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 the details of that, but what I do know is that God is just. And what I do know that every single sin that exists, every single wrong that is committed, God will take care of that. He's a perfect judge. And he will take care of it in his time and in his way. And he's much better able to do it than I am or than this poet was. And so we entrust God's justice and we don't take vengeance into our own hands. Entrust it to God. He will take care of that. You continue to serve him. So this bitter fruit can also make your body sick. This bitterness is bad news. It's, it's, it's a horrible sin. Bitterness can cause all kinds of physical issues. It can cause ulcers. It can cause high blood pressure. Now, not every bitter person is sick, and not every person who's sick is bitter. Uh, so we don't carry it that far. But every bitter person who stays bitter will ultimately suffer physical consequences. It will eat you up. A pastor years ago was preaching one Sunday to a church in New Jersey. After the service, a younger woman came up to him, and, and she was very well-dressed and, and attractive. She said, preacher, she said, I always itch. And, and she said, I have an itch I, I, I can't get rid of. And, and she said, it itches the worst when I go to church. She said, can you help me? 
Well, he talked with her, tried to do what he could. He wasn't a doctor, but, but he learned her physician's name and he called her doctor. And this is before all of the, the, the privacy regulations, that sort of thing. The doctor said that he couldn't find anything medically wrong with her. And so he'd just kind of written it off as some kind of a, a obsession that she had. But then the doctor told the pastor that he knew this woman and her only sister had had a falling out years ago and that there was a lot of bitterness in her life. And perhaps that bitterness just might be the source of the problem. He wasn't sure, but it was just kind of a hunch he had. So the pastor confronted the woman about her sister, and she broke down and admitted that they'd had a falling out years ago over the distribution of their deceased father's estate. Now, a lot of times I've seen this happen where folks get mad and they fight and they fuss over, over how a will is, is administrated. And, and so this minor disagreement blew up into a major argument. And the woman had determined that she'd never speak to her sister again. And it was at that very moment that the itching started. And so this pastor led her, led her to confess her sin of bitterness to God and to ask God to take all the bitterness and, and the hate away. Then he had to phone her sister, and, and, and he had her to phone her sister, and to ask her sister to forgive her. And when she hung up the phone, the lady looked at her pastor and said, that's amazing. I don't itch any longer. Now you could say, well, that's just a coincidence. and Maybe it was. I don't know. But I also know that bitterness is a very, very serious thing, and it has great ramifications. But there's very one important principle to learn about bitterness. The person it hurts worst is you. It doesn't hurt other people. It hurts you. Bitterness will poison your worship. It will paralyze your work. It will pollute your witness. Bitterness will do that. And so if you're taking notes, write this down, because this is important to remember. Bitterness does a great deal more damage to the vessel in which it is stored than to the object on which it is poured. Let me, let me say that again. Bitterness does a great deal more damage to the vessel in which it is stored than to the object on which it is poured. One writer has said, to lick your wounds to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are woofing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. So the third thing you need to know about bitterness the sin of bitterness, is that it's a destructive pursuit. We've already touched upon that. It's a destructive pursuit. If you don't rid yourself of it, it will destroy you. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So preacher, I'm convinced now that this bitterness is a serious thing, and this sin of bitterness is, is, is an awful place to be. So how do I get rid of it? First of all, you let it go. Just let it go go. Well, I can't, preacher. I want to hold on to it. Things have got to be righted. God will make wrongs right. You let it go. Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander along, uh, slander, along with every form of malice. Now, the phrase get rid of in this translation doesn't really convey what the Greeks say. The better way of wording it would be to say just stop it or just let it go. Release it. Let go of all the bitterness the rage, and the anger. Bury whatever it is that is making you bitter in an unmarked grave and don't go visit it again. Benjamin Franklin once said, doing an injury puts you below your enemy. Revenging one makes you even with him. Forgetting it sets you above him. Second, forgive. If you don't forgive, you fall short of God's grace. You fall short of what God would have you do. You disobey your Lord. Do you think that the offense that's been committed against you is any greater than the offenses that you've committed against God? How does God respond to you when you have wronged? Listen to Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate one to another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It doesn't matter how dirty you've been done, and I've heard some, some tales in my time. No one has been done dirtier than Jesus. No one. He was perfect. He is sinless. He was without fault. And he was treated as a common criminal. You are not holy. You are not without fault. Jesus had no business receiving the kind of treatment that he received, and yet it came. And yet as he was hanging on the cross, after he received the beating and the treatment and the mocking and all the things that happened to him, what did he pray? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus can pray that prayer, being the righteous, holy Son of God without an ounce of wrong in him, then he can empower you to pray that prayer through the presence of his Holy Spirit that's indwelling within you. Allow Christ to empower you to forgive. And if you can't find it in your heart to forgive, just think some more about the cross and what Jesus did on the cross. Charles Spurgeon once said, let us go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven, and then let us linger there to learn how to forgive. Forgive completely, forgive once and for all. You don't forgive halfway. You don't forgive and then dig up the matter again. It's tempting to do that, forgive it, and then you go back and you pick it up and you start fretting about it again. Third, you get rid of bitterness by forsaking the practice. It's not enough just to forgive. You've got to make it a lifestyle. Verse 14 says, make every effort to live at peace with all men. Now, the phrase make every effort here could literally be translated, give chase to it, pursue it, make it your heart's desire to be at peace with all of those around you as much as it's within you. It's not a feeble, half-hearted attempt to be at peace, but it's something that's deep within your heart and soul. How many of you have had maybe a couple of children that have been interacting with one another and they've been gotten in a spat or they've gotten in a fight, somebody hit somebody else or, or whatever, they took somebody's lunch, there's all kinds of things kids do that, that, that they get on one another's nerves and aggravate the other and they do what's wrong. And so then you may say, well, Billy, tell Susie that you're sorry. And so what kind of response do you get from kids? I'm sorry. There's not an ounce of sincerity in that. I mean, they're just being compliant. Okay, I'll do this so I won't get a whooping. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. And, so, and this go one and then their heart's really not changed. That's not how you forgive. That's not how you ask forgiveness. When you forgive and when you ask for forgiveness, it's something that comes from the heart. You truly let go. You truly allow the grace of God to change you. If you no longer have joy, happiness, peace, and contentment, and satisfaction after something someone has done to you, it's not because they took those things from you. You gave them away. I cannot control what happens to me. I can't do that. But I can control what happens in me. I can control how I react to what others do. And if you and I refuse to forgive, if we refuse to embrace God's holiness, who calls us to forgive, then you become like Esau, and I become like Esau, and we miss the blessing that we could have had as a result. So the very first step in dealing with bitterness is being born again. If you're dead in your sins, you can't get over bitterness. This is going to eat you up. But if you know Christ, and you have been given new life in Christ, then through the Holy Spirit living within you, you have that power and that capability. If you've been born again, then you need to repent of that sin of bitterness, and you need to forgive and let it go. And God's grace will enable you to do that. You may need to join this church family so that you can receive the support and encouragement you need to live a godly life. The reason we join church is not just to get our names on a list. The reason we join the church is so that we can hold one another accountable, so we can encourage one another and receive that kind of nurture that we need as believers in Christ. So this morning, will you remain bitter? You can hold on to it for years if you choose to do so. Or will you be obedient to God and get better through his grace, through turning to Christ and through forgiving those around you? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power 
that's evident in your word. We thank you for the power of this passage this morning. The sin, the sin of bitterness is something that, that it often just creeps up on us. It's, it's something that, that sneaks up on us. And yet, Father, so many of us have, have wrestled with it. So, Father, this morning we pray that we would focus upon Jesus and what he's done on the cross for us. May we understand that there's a deep root to bitterness, that it's, it's troubling, that it's destructive. And so may we turn from that and may we turn to Jesus. Some of us here this morning need to experience a new heart, a new mind. We've never asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins. We've never been saved. We've never been born again. And so may we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Give me a new heart and mind. I turn to you and ask you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Some of us here this morning may need to just confess that sin and let it go to entrust the wrongs that have been committed to your justice and then forgive so that we can move on with living the life that glorifies you, a life of love and grace and holiness in your presence. Some of us may need to become a member of this church so that we can be more fully supported and so we can more fully support one another as we seek to follow you. But Father, regardless, may we be obedient to your word this morning. May we follow you in the direction that you'd have us to go. For it's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 396, I'll Live for Him. We'll do the first and the last verses. Let's stand as we sing. Bob Withers, would you close us in prayer, please?